Question one, how would you describe this guy when he's not thinking about or admiring nature? This was a very popular question today. So to answer this question, we want to look for places where he's not inside nature. The most obvious one is line 21 and 22. For oft, which means because often, when on my couch I lie, which means when I lie on my couch, in vacant or in pensive mood, which means head empty, not thinking a lot. He's just stuck. So in this situation, he's at home lying on his couch, not his bed. It's not nighttime. It's in the middle of the day and he's lying on his couch. And he's not, he's, his mind is running, but he's not really thinking about anything. Does this sound like he's a happy man? Probably not. And then we can also look at the title and first line. I wandered lonely as a cloud. It means alone, but he calls it lonely. Whenever I read this line, it makes me think of like one cloud in the big blue sky. Totally alone. And then one more piece of evidence maybe you noticed. After enjoying nature, line 15, he says, a poet could not but be gay. Gay here means happy. Could not but be happy. Have no choice but be happy. Does that mean that he's usually not happy? Like nature is forcing him to become happy even though he usually is not. So to answer this question, he looks like a pretty lonely, depressed guy. Number two, how would you explain the wealth of the daffodils? Line 18. Uh, let's see. I, let's start from line 17. I gazed and gazed. So he keeps on looking at nature and these flowers and this whole beautiful scene. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. So at that moment, he didn't think about what he was getting, what wealth he was getting. What is this wealth? Line 19, four. Four means because, so he's going to explain. So yes, when he's not in nature, he's lying on his couch, lonely and like um, head empty. 21. In this moment, they, the scenes of nature, flash upon that inward eye, which means his mind's eye. So he sees them in his mind, which is the bliss of solitude. Bliss means happiness. So it suddenly he doesn't feel lonely. He feels happy when he's alone. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. When he thinks of these flowers, once again, he it's, it's like he's dancing with them again. So what is this wealth? This wealth is the ability to put aside his current sadness, uh, even depression, and to remember when he was happier. And this helps him get through day by day. Especially because in this poem, these two environments are separated. It looks like he doesn't live in the country. It looks like his house is away from nature. And we know that in this period, the most important development was the Industrial Revolution. Last week, we read 10 poems by Blake, most of which, I think all of which were pretty depressing. Uh, working poor people, working children, malnutrition, early death, orphans, pollution, just terrible. This is the kind of society that Wordsworth was also living in. But in this poem, we see the other side. We see what is outside of the city, nature. Why does Wordsworth care so much? Because he doesn't live here. This is not his day-to-day -day life. And as the Industrial Revolution continues, as cities get bigger and bigger, nature shrinks. This wealth becomes less and less. And that could be why he's such a sad guy. If we had more time, 
uh, I would like go through this poem with you very carefully because it's a wonderful poem. I love this poem so much. Uh, our other literature professor, Professor Tsai, also loves this poem very much. Uh, maybe you got the line message. We're having an English competition. Uh, and one of them is a uh, group recitation, Tuan Lang. And uh, one of the poems is this poem. That's how much we love this poem. Uh, okay, so moving on to question three. Why do you think the speaker's sister is in Tintern Abbey? What is her role or function? So one group took this question. And the sister appears on the last page. Line 121. Okay, so last week I told you that these two poems are talking about the same thing, except that the second poem is just longer. So this poem is also talking about how nature gives the poet energy uh, and it gives him like hope and comfort so that when he's away from nature, he can continue living his life. Line 121. My dear, dear sister. It's his younger sister, maybe. And this prayer I make, knowing that nature never did betray the heart that loved her. Her means nature. This is nature. Tis her privilege through all the years of this our life to lead from joy to joy. So throughout our life, nature can lead us from one moment of happiness to the next moment. For she can so inform the mind that is within us, so impress with quietness and beauty, and so feed with lofty thoughts. Lofty means high, high thoughts, good thoughts. That neither evil tongues, which means people saying bad things about you, Rash judgments, which means hasty judgments, uncareful judgments, nor the sneers of selfish men. To sneer means to mock. Nor greetings where no kindness is, nor all the dreary intercourse of daily life. Dreary means boring, intercourse means affairs. So all of the boring business of daily life. None of these things shall e'er prevail against us. None of them can overcome us. None of, none of them will conquer us or disturb our cheerful faith that all which we behold is full of blessings. So nature leads us to believe that our life is full of blessings. Therefore, let the moon shine on thee in thy solitary walk. So this is the prayer part. He's praying that the moon will always shine on his sister when she walks alone. And let the misty mountain winds be free to blow against thee. And in after years, so later, when these wild ecstasies, which means like crazy joyfulness, crazy happiness, shall be matured into a sober pleasure. So now we are filled with the happiness of nature. But in later years, when this happiness has sort of rounded off and become a more serious kind of pleasure. Um, let's skip a few lines. 142. Oh, then, so at that time, if solitude or fear or pain or grief, I don't, should be thy portion, so should happen to you, if that happens to you. With what healing thoughts of tender joy wilt thou remember me and these my exhortations? So in the future, when you feel sad and you think back on this prayer, I hope this prayer will bring you happiness. Now, the question is, why is his sister in this poem? Another way to think about this is if he's not talking to his sister, if his sister did not come with him, if he did not have a sister, how would he be able to say this? He would have to talk to the reader, 
which would feel very weak because we readers may not agree with him. Maybe we don't like nature. Some people don't like nature. But because he's talking to somebody in the poem who doesn't speak back, right? His sister doesn't say anything. It gives the poet and the speaker space and freedom to express his ideas and his emotions and his thoughts. And those ideas are the key parts of this poem. So what is the function of his sister? It is to give him an excuse to, to set out all of his thoughts about nature and healing energy and these things. This is the end of the poem. If you go back to the beginning, uh, there's a place where he mentions that we have come back to this place. Uh, one group found this. I can't remember where it is. You know what? Let's search for it. OK, this is not OK, there we go. We stood together. So this is line 150. Oh, uh, same page. Yes. On the banks of this delightful stream, we stood together. So yes, in this part, he's still praying for his sister, but in this line, he is standing next to his sister. They are standing together, looking at nature together. And by giving us this image, he is also inviting us to stand with them. On the banks of this delightful stream, this stream that makes us feel happy. Um, so throughout the poem, whenever he's describing nature, whenever he's uh, praising, admiring nature, he's always inviting us, the reader, to join him. So his sister has two functions. One is to give him an excuse to talk about this stuff. The other function is to accompany him to show us the possibility of enjoying nature together. So it's not just about himself. He's actually talking about everybody. Question four, why so much repetition? So is there repetition? Let's start from the beginning. Five years have passed, five summers. So we, we repeated the word five with the length of five long winters. Again, the five. And again, I hear these waters rolling from their mountain springs with a soft inland murmur once again. So he's repeating the word again. Very topical. Do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs? Nega. That on a wild secluded scene impressed thoughts of more deep seclusion, right? Secluded, seclusion. Uh, seclusion just means isolated from the world. And the day is come when I again repose. Line 11, these plots of cottage ground. A cottage is a small house in the woods. So these this little land around this house, these plots of cottage ground, these orchard tufts. An orchard is where you plant trees that grow fruit. A tuft is a small piece of land. So a small land around a house, small land for fruit trees. These plots, these orchard tufts. Uh, and then the most famous one, line 15, or line 14, once again, once again, I see these hedgerows. A hedge is a very short tree. These hedgerows, hardly hedgerows, little lines of sported wood run wild. So he sees rows of these short trees, but he thinks, you know, these are barely rows. Like when you think of a row of trees, you think of like a French garden, right? It's a full, uh, line of these trees, but he says that these are hardly hedgerows. 
So there are trees, but it, it they barely form a row. It's not really controlled by humans. They're little lines of sportive wood. Sportive means fun. Run wild. So like not controlled by humans. They were planted by humans, but not controlled by humans. So we see all of this repetition. Why? Let's take a short break and we'll finish the question when we come back.
So why so much repetition? When you read this passage and it keeps repeating itself, it seems like, for example, these hedgerows, hardly hedgerows, little lines of sportive wood run wild. You're not just seeing one hedgerow. You're seeing many hedgerows. Here's a hedgerow, here's a hedgerow, here's a hedgerow. It makes you feel like you are surrounded by nature, that you are inside of nature. So it's not just something that the poet is describing for you. You are there with him. And another possible reason is the poem ends with a prayer for his sister. A prayer is uh, traditionally a kind of song. So another possible reason for this repetition is by adding repetition, by making it seem more musical, it makes it seem more religious or spiritual. Uh, and that fits with the topic because nature is something you can pray to. Nature is something that can heal you. It's a spiritual kind of nature. Number five, do you think these poems are about nature? Why or why not? So the answer, of course, is both. Yes, obviously they are about nature, describing clouds, daffodils, stars, forests, streams, nature. But the reason these poems describe nature is for spiritual reasons, for personal reasons. If it were somebody else who didn't enjoy nature, but instead enjoyed, for example, Taylor Swift, then a similar poem could be written. You just change all of the nature stuff to Taylor Swift stuff, and it's the same kind of poem. So yes, these poems are about nature, but they're not really about nature. They're about what nature can help us with in life. Does that make sense? Yeah, OK. And number six, choose a poem. How can you tell it's written in the Romantic period? So let's go back and look at what the Romantic period is all about. Page. I don't even know, 19, I guess. Industrial revolution, yes. Enclosure, if you remember, enclosure is when landowners prevented farmers from having a common piece of land. So it is in one sense a kind of closing off of nature. Wordsworth is so important that he appears on the handout, great. Romanticism, individual, spontaneous, creative imagination and feeling. Yes, I think these poems fit. They are very individual. They're very personal. They are spontaneous. He goes there, he sees nature, he feels things. Very spontaneous. They are creative. He's not just describing nature. He's uh, giving a new perspective on nature uses imagination it does because like when he leaves nature he goes home and he imagines nature again and they are about feelings they are lyric poetry yes even though tintern abbey is slightly longer it is still considered lyric poetry and they are meditations on nature good so like standard romanticism Everyday life, very true. I wandered lonely as a crowd is about everyday life. When he goes home, he doesn't do anything special, right? He lies on his couch, very everyday life. Supernatural, you can think of the nature in these poems as a supernatural presence, right? Like if you think about nature like a scientist, then you, you the benefits of nature include like food, medicine, mental health. But if you think of nature as if nature is this kind of spirit or a kind of religion, then you can pray to nature. It can heal you. It can help you uh, get through life. So it's very supernatural. Gothic. I mean, vacant and pensive mood is kind of gothic. 
like when he's sitting and lying on his couch uh, deep in thought. It's a little bit gothic, a little bit dark, a little bit suffering. But not a lot in these poems. The, the gothic part is left outside of the poem because nature is not gothic for Wordsworth. Public, popular criticism, personal essay. Again, it's not an essay, but Tintern Abbey is a personal poem that tries to make a point. So it's kind of like an essayistic poem. Um, yeah, so those are the key ideas from the Romantic period that appear in these poems. Do you have questions about these six? OK, so next week. Um, we do still have class. So that means you do have to read some more before next class. At the same time, you will be doing the midterm exam. Uh, the exam will go on and you also have to read. So uh, sorry about that. Next week we are doing two poems. One is uh, Ulysses by Alfred Lord Tennyson. The other one is My Last Duchess by Robert Browning. If you look at the Victorian handout, the second handout, So I introduced the Victorian era last week. So starting on page two, the first poem is called Ulysses. Ulysses is the Roman name for Odysseus. You guys remember him? Won the Trojan War, spent 10 years getting home. That guy. Um, and this poem is about Odysseus, or the Romans call him Ulysses, in his old age. If you remember the story, he lost all of his crew, but in this poem, some of them are still alive. So like pretend he still has some crew. Uh, and it's about old age and not being content to die in his sleep. Uh, instead, wanting once again to have adventure. The next poem on page four is My Last Duchess by Robert Browning. Last has two meanings, right? The final one and the previous one. In this poem, you can say that both meanings work. Uh, both of these poems are have a main character. So previously we said that in a poem, the person who talks is the speaker and is not necessarily the poet. Not every poem is about the poet. These two poems are a good example. The first poem is not by Ulysses, but it is spoken by Ulysses. The second poem, it tells us, is spoken by some guy named Ferrero. And the footnote, uh, footnote one tells you that, uh, where is it? Here, this one. Ferrero is this guy who lived in Italy in the, 16, uh, in the 1500s. So it's a medieval Italian duke, Gongjun. So he's a duke. So when he says, my last duchess, he's talking about his wife. This poem is, uh, both of these poems are dramatic monologues. One character speaking to somebody else, but we don't hear the other person. If the first poem is about wanting to have adventure in old age, the second poem is he's trying to get a new wife. And that sounds kind of odd, right? To get a new wife, but that's exactly what this poem is about. So before next week, please read these two poems. Um, I should also tell you something about the poets, right? So the first guy, Alfred Lord Tennyson, he is a nobleman, right? Has a guizu. That's why he's called Lord Tennyson. Um, he was England's first poet laureate. Has the English第一个桂冠诗人. Very popular, very influential. Uh, but he, today he's not considered a like a very very. He's like a middle important poet. He, he's no longer a very important poet. His most uh, influential poetry is about King Arthur. But those poems are very long, and I don't think you want to read long poems. 
So instead I chose a short one. But he does like to write poems about history, legends, that kind of thing. The other guy, Robert Browning here, Robert Browning, a uh, very odd person. Like his manners are very odd. He's the kind of guy that you he will say something at a party and everybody will fall silent. He's most famous. For eloping with his wife. Uh, his wife is also a poet named Elizabeth Barrett Browning. When she was only known as Elizabeth Barrett, Robert came visiting their house uh, and uh, they fell in love, but Elizabeth's father did not let them marry. So in the middle of the night, they stole away together and got married in secret. Uh, and it was a very successful marriage. Today, his wife is a more famous poet than he is. But his poetry is still worth uh, discussing in terms of literary history. So like Elizabeth Baird Browning's poems are, I think are better, but they're the kind of poem that make you feel. And they're not necessarily related to the time period. So in terms of literary history, Robert Browning is the better choice. OK, that's next week. Questions? No, I know you guys are anxiously waiting the next part. Exams. OK, um, so the midterm exam is. Hang on. The midterm exam and, and the final exam, these are online open book take home exams. The dead, uh, it will begin at the end of this class. And it will end next Friday at midnight. So as I said, this means that the next time we see each other in class, the exam will still be going. So you may be uh, will have some questions for me. The exam will be an essay question. Senluntie. I will give you something to read that you have not read before. And you I will tell you which literary period it belongs to. And you have to tell me why. Why does it belong here? So let's go over the rules. The exams have deadlines but no timers, which means when you go on Moodle and you start the exam, you will have all the time until the deadline. Your answer must be an English essay with multiple unnumbered paragraphs. So a few ideas here. It must be in English. It must be an essay. It must have more than one paragraph. And the paragraphs should not be numbered. We are some being hall. If you do not answer the question, or you answer it in the wrong format, so like you don't follow the rules in the previous point, you will get 20 points, which is 50%. The highest score is 40 points. You can write your answer elsewhere and copy paste it into Moodle. So you don't have to keep Moodle open all week, right? You can write it and at the very end, copy and paste it in. You can submit as many answers as you want, and I will give you the highest grade. So I will not only look at your last answer. I will look at all of your answers and give you the best grade. So like, you know, if you send out your answer and you like go take a shower and in the middle of the shower, you wait, you think, wait, I forgot to mention this and you can submit another answer uh, and I will consider it also. The exams are open book. You can use any resource. Except other people. So you can look at the handouts. You can look at your notes. You can uh, watch these videos of the class. You can go online. You can go to the library. You cannot ask your grandmother because she is another person. So don't discuss the question with anybody else, but you can ask me questions. I wrote the question. I 
can decide how much information is too much information to give you. Now, you know, every time I say this, you can ask me questions. People think, uh, surely, you know, the press, the professor will always say, I can't tell you, I can't tell you. Let me tell you a story. So when I was in college, and I also had to take a linguistics class, as all of you are doing now, poor guys. And we also did not like it very much. It was hard. It was science. We didn't get it. Sorry, they didn't get it. I had a great time. My classmates did not like it. Um, but during the midterm exam, it was pen and paper, three hours in the classroom. The professor was sitting in front, right? And at the beginning of the exam, the, the professor said, if you have any questions, just raise your hand and ask. So one of my classmates, raised his hand and asked, Professor, how do you do question one? And the professor looked at him and he said, come here, I'll show you. And so my friend picked up his exam, came to the front, sat down next to the professor, and the professor showed him how to do question one. Now, I'm not going to show you how to do this question, but you can always ask. And the worst thing that can happen is I'll say, I can't tell you more than this. But maybe I will tell you something that could be useful. If you have any questions, you can always ask me about this exam. So like next week, we will see each other again. The exam will still be going. Great time to ask me questions. You can send me an email. You can send me a message on Teams. You can try to corner me in the hallway with a knife, not with a knife. Don't use a knife. Um, or if you know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who has my line, you can also send me a line message. OK, in your answer, you must give specific evidence from at least four different points in the assigned text, not just four examples. So. You have to give four examples to support your answer, but they cannot come from the same part or the same place in the text. You cannot use one example to explain four different ways. You cannot look at two lines and pick out four different words. It has to be four examples, each from a different part of the text. And this is how I uh, right. And along with your evidence, you must tell me the page number or the line number in parentheses next to each piece of evidence. So when you give me evidence, you must tell me what page is it or what line is it if it's a poem. This is how I will grade your exam based on how uh, whether you have four good supporting pieces of evidence. If you give me four good pieces of evidence to support your answer, you will get 40 points. If you give me three good pieces, you will get 36. Two, you will get 32. One, you will get 28. And if you give me evidence, but it doesn't really support your answer, I can tell that you tried. I will give you 26, uh, 24. 24 is 60%. So if even if you don't know how to answer, even if you're very confused, try your best. But if you don't give me any examples and, or you don't follow the rules or you answer the wrong question, you will only get 50%. 20 points, 50%. If you use information from other sources, Give me the name of the source, like the title, the web address, if it has one, and page number or timestamp, if it has one, for videos, in parentheses next to each piece of information. So this means you cannot, at the end of your essay, just say, these are my sources. Every time you use an outside source, you must tell me next to that information, right beside it, where is it from? If you don't tell me where it's from, 
uh, if you don't give me a like for the first one, when you read the assigned text, if you don't give me a page number or a line number, I will pretend like it does not exist. If you use an outside source and you don't give me the specific source information, uh, that's what I just said, right? I, it will not be counted. But if you use an outside source and you don't give me information, I will count that as plagiarism. If you try your best and you don't get it, your lowest score is 20. If you plagiarize, if you use outside information and you don't tell me, you get zero. This includes even the smallest things. Sometimes people will think, OK, my answer, I wrote that. But if I want to give you a, a summary of this text, I can look it up online. You can, but you have to tell me that you did not write it. Somebody else wrote it. Even if it's not an important part of your answer, if you use information from elsewhere, you still have to tell me. So these are the exam rules. Questions? OK, so here's some more information. Um, if you're wondering why plagiarism is so serious, here is an essay in Chinese giving you like a historical context about plagiarism. Now, I know that most of you probably do not have experience answering essay questions. So here are some example answers to other essay questions. They are not answers to this question. They are answers to other questions. So the information in these answers will not be useful to you, but the way that they are written is something you can learn from. Uh, and uh, here's the ex specific exam question. Read the William Wordsworth poem, My Heart Leaps Up on the main Moodle page. I will show you this poem later. Aside from the author and year of publication, so your answer cannot depend on the author, cannot depend on the year that the poem was published, because that would be too easy. How can you tell it was from the Romantic period? Because it was written by Wordsworth during the Romantic period. Too easy. You have to look at what the poem actually says. How can you tell that it was written in the Romantic period as defined in the handout? So if you go online and look up Romantic period and it gives you information that is not in the handout, that does not count as the Romantic period. It has to be according to the handout. And your answer must mention the Romantic period. This seems kind of obvious, but sometimes people will say because blah, 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 and they don't actually mention the Romantic period. So, you know, one good way to start your answer is this poem belongs in the Romantic period because. Now, some things you can think about. You can consider the poem's meaning, imagery, yi xiang, meter, ge lu, rhyme scheme, ya ring gui zhe, language, si yong yu yan, and historical background, li si beijing. If you go below, you will see a very, very, very big white box. This box is not here for you to fill the box. You don't have to fill the box. It is very big to encourage you to give as much information as you want. In fact, if you try to fill the box, it will just keep growing. It's an infinite box. It's a bottomless box. So don't try to fill the box. Questions about this? OK, so finally, let me show you the poem. The, the poem is on Moodle. And. 
Now you too can see the poem. That's it. That's the whole poem. My heart leaps up. My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. So was it when my life began. So is it now I am a man. So be it when I shall grow old or let me die. The child is father of the man, and I could wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety. And there's a footnote at the for the end of the poem. It says, uh, natural piety, perhaps as distinguished from piety based on the Bible, in which the rainbow is the token of God's promise to Noah and his descendants never again to send a flood to destroy the earth. So that's the poem. Um, for the rest of this period, you can sit and think about this question. You can come and ask me questions. You can go look for information. And the exam will begin when the bell rings. 打钟就可以开始作答。